Hello and welcome to our weekly credit chat that we host every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and on Twitter. Credit chat is a time when we get together to talk about credit and money issues that matter to all of us. You know, every week we cover a different personal finance topic and today we're talking about the home buying process and what first time home buyers need to know. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our special guests. First, we have Martha Staten. She's a realtor and advocate for personal finance in schools. And you can find her at Saucony and Suds. That's her Twitter handle is at S-A-U-C-O-N-Y-A-N-D-S-U-D-S. We also have Douglas Bunparth, and he's a CFP board ambassador and VP at Life and Wealth Planning. And you can find him at Doug Bunparth. That's at D-O-U-G-B-O-N-E-P-A-R-T-H. As always, we have Rod Griffin. He's our Director of Public Education here at Experian, and his Twitter handle is at Rod underscore Griffin. And behind the scenes, who's doing it all, we have Christina Roman. She's our Social Media Specialist here at Experian North America, and she'll be tweeting from our Experian underscore US Twitter handle, as well as from her personal account, which is at Tina underscore LaRoe. And my name is Mike Delgado, and I'm the Senior Manager here of Social here at Experian, and my Twitter handle is at Mike Delgado. I want to let you know that there's a bunch of ways for you to join us today, and we invite you to join us on Twitter. And all you need to do is look for the Credit Chat hashtag, and you'll see the conversation happening right now. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question to our panel, would like to contribute to the conversation, we invite you to just tweet with the Credit Chat hashtag, or if you prefer just to read along, uh, just do a search for Credit Chat. And if you prefer to use our special Experian uh, Twitter chat room, we have a short URL set up, and you can simply go to ex.pn slash tweet chat, and that'll bring you into our special Twitter chat room where you'll just see the tweets associated with credit chat. You know, sometimes when you go to Twitter, you'll, you can see a lot of conversation happening that's not related to uh, the topic that you want to follow. So if you want to follow just the credit chat stream, you can go to ex.pn slash tweet chat. And if you're watching here on YouTube and would like to join the conversation here, we would love to hear from you. And there's a couple of ways for you to participate with us. In the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a little widget that says, Be Part of the Conversation. And if you click on that link, you'll be brought into a special YouTube chat room where you can actually thumbs up the things that are being said. And you can also type in your comments for the panel or your questions. So we invite you to, to join us here on YouTube. Uh, some people are kind of freaked out that they click on that little button and they're going to all of a sudden be on video. And don't worry, that's not going to happen. All that is going to happen is you'll be brought into a special place where you can actually thumbs up content and where you can also ask questions to our panel. So we invite you uh, to, to join us here on YouTube. Now today, you know, we're talking about the home buying process and before our chat, I was taking a look, uh, Martha and Douglas, at just what the cost of housing is today. And here, these are some metrics actually from 2014. It was really the, the last stats I could actually see that had like a lot of um, information on them. And here's just kind of like a look at the, the map. And I know, uh, Douglas, you're there in New York. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're here in California. And you can just see like the, the, the median cost of, of new houses just can be very, very expensive depending on where you live. And then I was looking at just at the metro level, and again, you can kind of see that it kind of mirrors what the, at the state level, but you can kind of see the pockets of where things are very, very expensive. Uh, certainly here in, on the west coast of California and definitely on the north northeast section, Massachusetts, New York, uh, very, very expensive. Um, and then I was looking at the Wall Street Journal, the uh, article that published in May, about home prices starting to heat up. Mm -hmm. So just a lot of, uh, you know, cost of housing can be very, very expensive. It looks like prices are starting to heat up during the summertime. And Martha, I know you've been practicing real estate for a long time and curious about just in your area, how, how is the market doing? Uh, it's heating up also. Um, we're seeing a variety of uh, buyers. Uh, investors are still uh, here dabbling a little bit. Um, uh, our big season is really from about October through April when we have our winter visitors come. Um, and of course many of them are not first time home buyers, they're looking at a vacation home or a relocation home. Um, but we are seeing the older millennials start to come into the market. Um, real estate has really picked up. We're, uh, we're ahead of where we were last year. 
which is good for everybody. Yeah, yeah that's great. Douglas, uh, in, your, in your conversations with millennials, and especially living in an expensive area like New York, what, what's like the feeling, the vibe that they give you about buying versus renting? Sure. Some some feel that they're going to be renting forever. Um, mm-hmm. Homeownership is is very difficult uh, in in Manhattan. I mean, that's probably not a reality for you know ninety nine point nine percent of the yeah. population. But uh, even as you go out to the suburbs, you know, um, it, it's it's really expensive. You know, the, the whether it's Long Island or uh, North Jersey. You know those valuations are are quite high. Uh, you can look at their values relative to where they were just four or five years ago, and and it's crazy. So with millennials, it's how how are we going to make this a reality? How am I get actually going to overcome our economic realities? Whether it's dealing with student debt. I mean, you know, right. some have two mortgages already, and they're not mortgages. They're you know the rent they're paying in the city or around the city, as well as what their uh, liabilities are from education. So. It's a very uh, challenging area, uh, but it can be addressed. You know, it can be planned for. Yet, uh, nonetheless, it's it's often a challenge for young people, and I think it's going to ultimately push back home ownership for a big chunk of the generation, and that might have some some uh, economic impacts. You know, it's a lot of consumption tied to real estate. So we'll see and keep a careful eye on on what those ramifications are. Uh, I'm I'm very curious. Your your point about the uh, the rent um, that the millennials or non um, home ownership folks are facing uh, it, it's to me it's an interesting phenomenon to see rents going up as quickly as they are um, people not being able to maintain that savings level like they had before um, and yet they're paying a rent that's equal to or greater than mm. some mortgage payments yeah. And that is very discouraging and very frustrating. Um, and they don't really see a way out. You know, they they can't stop paying the rent. They can't yeah, yeah. find more affordable rent. And sure. yet, a lot of them are desperate to make that first step to home ownership. So Absolutely. it's an interesting problem. Yes. Yeah, Martha, as you're talking, I was thinking about just in our area um, in the. Orange County area. If you want to live near good schools, which is really important for young yeah. families, and, and we, my wife and I have two little ones, and so we want to be in a good school district for our kids. You know, for a single family home, if you wanted to rent, you're looking at easily three thousand dollars a month. Sure. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, uh, we know somebody who actually moved up to Colorado with a pay increase and a job, and was excited, thinking, oh, "I'm finally going to be able to save for down payment, buy a house." And the rent up there was more expensive than what he had been paying before. He was completely taken aback by that. Um, so again, it's you know, what do we do? We're dangling these low interest rates in front of in front of potential buyers, and yet they can't really act upon it. Even with the um, with the the loan programs that are out there now for uh, first time buyers that make it a little bit easier. And Martha, you just you just mentioned the interest rates, and I did look at Bankrate.com has mm-hmm. a, a list of the the current mortgage rates, and I guess right now the average for a 30-year fix is about 4.13 percent. But we're even seeing a little bit of an increase from last month. Absolutely, yep, it's starting to tick up um, little bit by little bit. Uh, you know, uh, we like to think that they're still at a historical low, but um, everybody's watching it very carefully, and they're seeing the increase. You know, we get our on Friday afternoons, we get our uh, our mortgage rates for the weekend, and yeah, you know you can you can easily track it. Of course, you track it every hour uh, if you're looking for a loan. Um, Douglas can talk to that probably more effectively than I do. But um, you know, what do we do for these first-time home buyers that have these carrots dangling in front of them? Uh, home affordability is still it's still out there, but the rents for many of them are holding them up. No doubt. And Douglas, you mentioned just about student loan debt and how that's affecting millennials. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's huge. You know, um, I've been blog I've been blogging about something called uh, the millennial problem, which you could check out on my on my personal website. And this is really about how um, 
you know, financial, the lack of financial literacy isn't just with the millennial generation. It's, it's a societal problem. You know, it's not really taught in the classroom in any way. But it's more or less caught up to the millennial generation in that the rising cost of education and the way that the labor environment has changed. You, you don't spend 30 years at a, at a firm, get a gold watch and a pension anymore. So startups and, you know, it's, it's, it's become not cool to stay at a firm, you know, for more than, you know, five or ten years. <laughs> staying there. So these, these main factors, and, and large in part financial literacy or the lack thereof, and student loans, um, the availability of them, the rising cost of education. So now the paradigm's really shifted. You know, $100,000 to get an undergraduate degree for a $50,000 job in the big city, you know, that math doesn't really work. And because of that, you know, it's, it's having these effects such as home ownership or watching rent take more than 36% of your gross right. pay. You know, it's it's 50 to 60 to 70%. That's why the math doesn't really work very well. So, yeah, I could talk more about how we need financial literacy in the classroom, and, and Martha, I'm sure you're all for that. I mean, I am I'm with a zealot-like passion for that. <laughs> but the reality is many, at least the older half of the millennials, like myself and my wife, who, who do carry a, a a lot of debt, putting ourselves through uh, not only undergrad but graduate school. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like I said earlier, I'm looking at a mortgage-sized student loan payment that fortunately we can make every month, but what about the, you know, I, I'd much rather that go towards uh, the savings we're making towards a home. So, um, you know, what happens when we want to start a family, you know, and we look at child care, it's one thing after another, and there's right. always one more thing that we're dealing with that maybe our parents and grandparents didn't have to deal with, you know. Uh, another point is that college education has become a right, not, not necessarily a privilege. You know, a very, very cynical view of this is, well, my grandparents, you know, um, went through a war and fought in it, and, you know, you get your slice of American pie for doing that, and, and uh, you, you should, you know, you, you definitely did something big there. Our parents had the privilege of going to, you know, it, it was a privilege to go to college, and if you did that, you, you were at a big advantage. Now that it's a right, you know, you're, you're maybe getting some crumbs of that pie and, you know, a big bag of student loan debt. Um, so, you know, this is an issue that millennials are facing, and you know, it was the graduating class of 2015 had an average of about $37,000 in debt per, per student. I, I mean, you know, that's unheard of. The cost of education has gone up 500% since 1985, and CPI has gone up 115%. So you're telling me education went five times more than just about anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Groceries. So this is a big issue. We got to keep our eyes on it. One point two trillion dollars in student right. debt is a very valid reason why first-time home purchase uh, home purchases for millennials is is a really big problem. And uh, I wish I had all the answers. I, I my opinion is government will have to step in at some point. Uh, arguably, on the taxpayers' back or so. You're, Refinancing student loans, forgiveness—it's it, it, a big, you know, spider web here. I wonder what direction they'll go in. Um, but those types of things could ultimately lead to uh, making it easier to buy your first home. And and Martha talked a little bit about rates. Um, and I, I would kind of ask you a question, Martha. You know, if rates are going to go up, let's say, you know, consensus is later this year. You know, granted, that's the front end of the curve. What about on the back, you know, it's going to take a little while for it to trickle into the, the longer end, but how high can that realistically go? You know, it, it's hard enough for millennials to even come up with the down payment. Right. But what about, you know, yeah. we, we always think about the down payment, but what about carrying the cost of that home? Okay. Well, you know, we just increased the interest. You know, can it go up to 6 or 7%, which isn't that far off from historic levels? I, I, it's going to be that much harder for young people if that happens. So I wonder what's going to happen there. Yeah, and I don't have the crystal ball either, Douglas. Um, but, you know, the the effect that rising interest rates have on home purchases, of course, is the decrease in the amount that you can afford. So, you know, a millennial who's entering the the uh, the housing market and looking at a I'll say a $250,000 home and and doesn't or can't act right away as the interest rates creep up all of a sudden that $250,000 home is now not affordable we're looking mm -hmm. at 
200, 225. Right. You know, there is a percentage of the older millennials who did buy in, in the National Association of Realtors had a uh, survey out, and I think about 32% of all home purchases last month, the month of May, were by the older millennials, and older being 27 to 35. So there is movement. Um, they're not what we'd like to see, though. Um, yeah. And again, it, it goes back to the amount of debt they're carrying. You know, like you said, Douglas, the student loan, the rise in rents, um, and not maybe not being all that educated with the home buying process. And you know, maybe for some of them, it is a realistic goal. Maybe they're not ready to make that commitment. Uh, you know, a lot of them are putting off getting married, having families. They're right. not. They're not my generation. I, I got married two weeks after I graduated from college, <laughs> and you know, I had a baby a year later. So, um, uh, it is an interesting trend. Um, I talked to my nieces and nephews a little bit, and um, they just they some of them think that renting is more affordable right now um, than buying, and uh, I don't know if that's their way of saying I'm not ready to buy, if that's yeah. their way of saying I'm not ready for the commitment. But um, it is, you know, it is it is what it is for a lot of those millennials and that's it's not a good thing. Is it I guess I'm gonna ask a, a couple of hard questions that I keep mulling over. The first is the notion and Martha you probably heard me I probably ask you these things. Um, it used to you people say the key to building wealth is buying a home, and I'll be quite frank and tell you I think that's hogwash. Um, <laughs> the, well, I can tell you right now that I live in Texas, where home buy, home prices are low still, although competition's increasing. Where I have equity in my home, but every penny of equity I've had, I put in maintaining and caring for and right. updating the home, and I don't think people think about that. You know, there's no if I sell my home, what do I do? I get some money, I go buy a bigger house. That's what most people do. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not building wealth. I think that's the first thing. So maybe renting isn't all bad and you know, we, we need to look differently at buying a home you know, because we still approach it like the American dream is to own a home. Yeah. Is that the case? Um, and the other question I have is, and I bump into millennials and I go, okay, you have, a, and Douglas, you mentioned the average student loan debt was about $35,000. Yeah. Um, just looked up quickly at uh, the average oh. new car a back was almost thirty thousand dollars. So, you know, my question is if we can pay thirty to forty thousand dollars for a new car, why can't we pay thirty to forty thousand dollars for our student loan debt on average? And granted it's averages and granted there you know, I have a niece too that's you know, her student loan debt is going to be Frightening. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, but it, is the tone of our discussion right? Are we looking at things holistically? And you know, when somebody, you know, I've had and I've had millennial, I think kids now makes me feel old, but they come up, <laughs> mom, that's killing me, and I look and I go, but you're driving a brand new Lexus. Right. Um, right. What are we doing here? Yeah. It's all about choice, uh, so, Brad. It's so all about What are the choices we make? So yeah, I'm saying, I guess I'm saying, you drive the nice car. And sure, we all sure. on the call worry about buying a house because that's what we want to do. Right. Um, are we putting? I guess the bottom line question I have is: Are we are we too much today on owning a home right away, or when you're when you're younger, or maybe it's you know maybe it's um, just a different mindset that we kind of are trying to adapt to. I, you know, I read an interesting article and it said that the millennials are the most educated generation. The most educated generation. I'll put a period at the end of that. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> so, are I, back to you, Rod? You know, are they educated in the sense that they um, that they know that homeownership is not to be considered uh, an investment? I, it's interesting. The first time I heard that phrase was uh, right after um, the big crash, and um, people were talking about, you know, since when did homeownership become an investment? It, it's a place where you raise a family, or it's a place where you, you know, enjoy your backyard. Right. Why do we have to look at home ownership strictly as an investment? So I do, I do agree with that. I don't think it's so much of an investment, but is it a way for folks to get ahead? 
Is it a way, Douglas? Is it a way for them to get out of that rent trap where they're where they're actually paying somebody else's mortgage? Yeah, I yeah. I, I think uh, I don't I don't think the desire to I'll speak for myself here, but I don't think the desire to own a home is is lost or gone. I mean, my wife and I have been saving for a home since we got married, and a little before that which is going on, you know, almost two, two and a half years now. And and the struggle is real, you know. It's getting, you know, with the loans, with wanting to start a family and all these things we've mentioned, you know, um, coming up with that extra amount to save towards the home. It's like, all right. If, and all these factors that are changing, too. If rates go up, it's going to, am I chasing something I can't get? But, uh, uh, and, and Rod, I'll get to the whole Lexus first home thing in a second. <laughs> but, you know, I was at a I was at a focus group the other day and someone said, "Oh, you know, well, that's my own kids by the way." So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was at this focus group and a non-millennial and I love non-millennials said, "You know, oh, you know, they read an article about we we like sharing and carpooling and, you know, keeping things more manageable like that." I'll be honest with you again, speaking for myself here, no. I, I want a house with a picket fence, a couple kids, a dog and, you know, what you grow up on. Don't yeah, yeah. I don't know where that's coming yeah. from. <laughs> reality is for us, you know, the, the burbs of North Jersey are, you know, two and a half, three times that of, you know, per square foot of just about anywhere else in America. I mean, it, 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 it's crazy. We go visit my family in Florida, and we, we go around a new development, that, and we cry. We're like, we can do <laughs> right yeah. now. I mean, a brand new, it's not even built yet. We got a brand new spec home around the block from my parents, and it's like, what are we, what are we doing here? But that's more of a, a conversation of, of this general area. But yeah. to address your point about you know are our priorities right? We're taking out vehicles. You know here here's how I'd like to phrase that. You know it's very interesting using statistics here. Sure, the average might be dollars per person, right? But look at the other parts of that bell curve. I mean, I have many clients, lawyers, doctors, uh, you know. Um, things like that. I mean, those degrees are hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, people aren't going out and buying Lamborghinis here, you know. <laughs> they are at a much, they're doing that at a much, much less frequency than the Lamborghini of, you know, a, a top ten business school or law school degree, which, you know. So when you look at those stats and the statistics, you have a lot more millennials carrying a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in debt, you know, and that, obviously, that's not the equivalent, you know, of the Lexus. So keep that scale and relative measure there. And another big thing, if they're going out and buying that luxury vehicle and they and they maybe or arguably should not have done that, again, I'm going to point to financial literacy. Did mm -hmm. they understand the impact of taking out that lease or purchasing that car in the same way that they may or may not have understood the impact of taking out $100,000 in student loans from the years of being nine, uh, of being 18 to 22? So if you're not financially empowered, you're bound to make that financial misstep. You're borrowing from your future self is yeah. basically what it is. You yeah, know? the vehicle right. is you know, a car. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a utility less than you know collateralizing your brain so you can have an earning stream greater than uh, the national average by having educated yourself with a college degree or graduate degree. You know, those stats are there. We're... we're really lucky here in southern Arizona with some financial literacy and I don't want to get off topic but um, the Tucson Association of Realtors has a, um, a high school program and it's from high school to home ownership and they actually go through you know the budgeting and the savings and the the uh, opportunity costs mm -hmm. and all of those factors that one needs to be educated and comfortable with before they purchase the home, and then the home purchase may be years away, but it's building that foundation of that financial literacy knowledge that when the time comes, they should hopefully be able to rely on that. Um, um, the, the exciting thing about the program, too, is that for many of these kids where this curriculum is put in front of, um, they're, they're going to be first-generation homeowners. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not talking just about first-time home buyers, but they're going to be first-generation home buyers, and mm -hmm. that's very exciting to see them react to, you know, the possibility I might be able to do this, and you know, that's that's exciting. That's exciting for us as as a society to see yeah. that kind of enthusiasm for saving and becoming more financially literate, and uh, for the 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 student him or herself. 
I love I love that, and and likewise, you know, I love seeing these things. They exist, hopefully, in everyone's community. Yeah. They got to come together a little more. I don't know if being backed by a financial institution is the way to go. Although I can give companies like Visa or, or and stuff like that a lot of credit for getting it out there. I think maybe more objective nonprofits the way to go. And I know in uh, in in the New York City area, I'll I'll throw them a shout out because I do volunteer for them. Uh, Wise working in support of education. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Putting yeah. high school, uh, putting financial literacy programs in the high school, I can get behind that. I mean, that's exact. That's exactly what we need. You know, they're that's right. mandatory. Mandatory. That's right. That's right. So it would be interesting to know the um, to do a survey of um, millennials that are looking to buy but they haven't bought yet, and and not only the reasons why, but how many of them had the opportunity to have financial literacy. In their schools, how many of them feel like they're somewhat financial literate? Yeah, if I sur if I surveyed, you know, 50 to 60 percent of my clients who are millennials, you know, by virtue of having these conversations with them, uh, it's it's very sad and disappointing. I don't yeah. even want to assign a, a single digit to it. You know, it's yeah. it's, just, it's pretty much non-existent. And I'm always happy when I do hear about it. it makes me feel like, oh, this does exist and. I think the sad reality is it it doesn't in in spades. Yeah, and I know Rod is very familiar with all of that with the programs he's involved with. Yeah, and, and Douglas, you mentioned Wise. We've had a relation experience had a relationship with Wise. We've been a, we're a founding partner of the Jumpstart Coalition, and awesome. Martha and I know each other, and, and a number of other organizations that we support. So we're completely we're on board with we'll help you standards in every school across the country, we would love it. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what we need. And just basic fundamental financial knowledge. Because I think you're absolutely right. It opens the door for people to pursue their dreams, whatever they might be, and to a home ownership, uh, you know, family, everything. So I think it's hugely important. And we're just not there. No. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. I want to ask uh, Douglas, you know, when someone approaches you about you know needing some financial advice about buying a home or whether they should be renting, what are, what are some what are some practical tips you'd give them when they're in that process of trying to decide what they what they should do? Yeah, it comes up frequently. You know, uh, granted, I, I I'd argue the largest part is the cost mechanics. You know, is really understanding what they can afford. Um, not only, again, not only coming up with the down payment, but people focus on that a lot more than the actual cost of carrying a home. You know, and also thinking about that cost in an after-tax way. You know, it's one of the first, other than having children, it's one of the first things that we really start to get some tax benefits. Um, so it's, it's how they're thinking about the cost mechanics. Um, so owning a home, you know, typically, and, and really is more involved than renting. You know, do you want to handle the responsibility of upkeep of the property? Do you want to worry about maintenance and appearance? Deal with the repairs that come along the way, mm -hmm. increases in property taxes. You know, uh, let's not forget about insurance and the liability situations. So, you know, needless to say, owning is uh, a lot more responsibility and a lot more involved than renting. So, I want to have these conversations with them to say, hey, are you at a point in your life and your financial life where you know you're you're in a position to deal with these types of things? What's going on in your career right now? Are you trying to make partner or manage it? You know, you don't have time for this stuff. You know, do you need to be closer to your job right now, or do you need to get away from your job? Mm. Also, uh, the, the, the major consideration is uh, time, time parameters. How long do you plan on staying in a particular area? Right. You know, if you're only there a few years, say you're a resident and you know you're, 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 you might be working at a hospital halfway across the country in a, you know, a couple of years, well, you know, ownership might not be what's for you. Uh, if, if you need to get in and out more effectively and efficiently, then you know, renting is going to be the ticket. Also, uh, pay attention to uh, the economic environment. You know, um, this goes back to this notion that you know owning a home is is a first investment. I, I agree with all of you. I do not talk to my clients about their home being an investment. You know, if you break even or make some money on it, if and when the time comes for you to get out, good job. It is a roof over your head first. Yep. You know, if you happen to luck out being in the right place at the right time in the economy, and oh my goodness, there's a windfall. Great, I've had clients hit that, you know, jackpot, so to speak, and it's a, it's 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 a great thing to have happen. But it should not be, uh, really, one of those main driving factors when it it, it comes to uh, 
you know, buying a home. But those are the, those are typically the things that we talk about in that conversation. So affordability, uh, time horizon, and responsibilities. You know, those are the three main points I would drive home when thinking about renting uh, versus buying. I had a, a first-time home buyer a year ago. Uh, good income, good solid income. Um, Rod, you'll appreciate this. Uh, credit was pulled by the suggested lender, and oops, there was a little blemish on the credit report. Mm. So um, he didn't qualify for the loan. Okay, he he accepted that. That was fine. So it was suggested to him, and he followed through. Um, your monthly payment if you had purchased would have been X amount of dollars. You're paying this amount in rent right now. Save that additional money each month and see if, looking back, were you comfortable with that amount? Were you comfortable taking you know, an extra $500 out of, your, out of your paycheck and putting it away where in reality that would have been the additional cost for a mortgage? Um, he came back a year later and was able to purchase and um, and had all that money saved up. Mm. He saved it was actually about four hundred and seventy five dollars a month that he had saved, mm. which would have reflected the mortgage payments. So um, that's a good practice tool if people you know if first time buyers have that opportunity to save that long without having to be forced to save it because of a bad credit report. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Rod, I, I wanted to get to that, uh, which is, you know, in preparation for buying a home, can you talk a little bit about uh, the importance of looking at a credit report and things to be looking for? Oh, absolutely. That's the first thing and that, that a mortgage lender is going to look at is your credit history. They want to, you're about to apply for and take on the biggest debt of your life over the probably half of your lifetime going forward. So they want to, if it's mine anyway, if, <laughs> you know, maybe longer the way it's going. Um, but um, the, 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 you know, so it's, it is the most important debt, largest debt that almost any of us take on. So they're going to look at that credit report. You have to be able to manage the debts you already have. If you can't manage the debts you have, you're not going to be able to get that mortgage. So you need to know what's in your credit report. You need to use that report as a, financial tool. You don't want to be have any surprises when you go talk to that mortgage lender and there's no reason for there to be today. You can get your credit report, you can get credit scores, you can get the factors that the lenders are going to see. You can know exactly what that lender is going to look at when you walk in that door or go online and shouldn't have any surprises. So take that credit report, that piece of the puzzle should be should be a no-brainer. Right. If you open your report and you have late payments maxed out accounts, you probably need to step back and, you know, as Martha said, you start looking at saving. You make sure you get those debts under control well in advance. And, and you know, that it's it's the first hurdle you have to clear. Absolutely. And you you've got to get that pre-qual and you've got to uh, talk to that lender before many realtors will take you out in a car and show you a property. I mean, why show you a $400,000 house when you're only eligible for a 300 or why show you 150 when you're only going to be eligible for a $100,000 mortgage? So that's very, very important and get those, um, you know, know who's reporting the credit rod, like you said, and clear up any, any um, um, mistakes or blemishes on it and then move forward. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Part of that is knowing who to go talk to if you need help on that. You know, there uh, I I'm a certified financial planner, but if I'm out of my depth on something, I need to go talk to other professionals about that. You know, I'm I'm not a mortgage broker. I I do not understand mortgages like they do. I might know more than the average person, but you know, I might be able to get nitty gritty with them. But I need them to actually get down and dirty with those details. So. You know, whether it's um, talking to a mortgage broker, talking to licensed agents, or sitting down with a, a certified financial planner, you know, this is going to be your financial team, you know, and, and really your educational team to understand, you know, what you need to know and what you can do to improve a situation if that needs to happen, you know. And this, especially, you know, again, bring up the millennial thing, especially if you're carrying the student loan debt. Well, do you know what percentage of, uh, you know, debt to income you need to have to qualify. Right. If you, do, you can look at various payments, you know, they're going to look at how much 
you need to pay every month. Well, there's income data for payment plans. There's extended payment plans. Not saying, you know, I don't want to say you can game the system, but you can be strategic about how you represent your financial life. Now, credit report and credit score is one thing, but also your debt to income ratio, kind of credit lines you have outstanding. Um, you can, in some ways, make yourself look better pretty quickly. It will, t you know, obviously credit uh, scores will take some time here, but at least on some of those other ratios, um, there's a lot you can do right now. And the difference between being able to do that and not is simple education and educating yourself. So go talk to those professionals. You can talk to me. I'll bite. You know, there, there's people <laughs> willing to have those conversations. I, I make that investment every day in a, an entire generation so they know, you know, this isn't about sales. This is about getting you information so you can make constructive decisions for you and your financial life. I think professionals will get a lot of thumbs up and pats on the back from not only their clients and prospects, but from the communities in general. So let's, you know, let's get away from where we were in 08, predatory lending, all these really terrible words and feelings, which still do exist and reasonably so, and start to change the focus. Let's start to change the conversation and understand that professionals, at the end of the day, are still here to help you. And let's, let's make that the message once again. Love that, Douglas. Uh, go ahead, Rod. I say, and Douglas, that's a great point. You know, one of the things we have to know is what we don't know, and then get yeah. help. You know, and I think that's huge. And Martha, you made a great point about getting pre-qualified. You know, from a, a a realtor standpoint, you want to know that you're showing them the right homes. But from the, you know, I was. Oh, uh, Rod. Looks like Rod's kind of frozen there. A good look, Rod. <laughs> yep, uh, looks like he'll, he'll be able to get back in. Um, Martha, um, yeah. Rod was just uh, talking about, and Rod talked oh. about the credit side, yeah. and and then Douglas was talking about kind of like the finance side and the importance of talking yeah. with someone to get your financial house in order. Can you talk a little bit from the real estate agent side? What are some things that person who's, you know, let's say this person's already gone through the process, they looked at their credit report, everything looks good, they've talked to a CFP, uh, like Douglas to kind of make sure that their financial house is in order. They mm -hmm. feel like, okay, we've done the calculations. It makes financial sense for us to go ahead and buy a house. We're ready to meet with an agent. What are some things that you'd like them to have prepared aside from the financials when they come to meet with you? Well, the financials really, that's a huge part of it actually. And um, in the state of Arizona, we are uh, rewriting our purchase contract and a buyer now has to be pre-qualified. It used mm -hmm. to be um, there was a box on the page and you could check that the pre-qual was or was not attached. Now it is a require. It's going to be a requirement. But it, it, getting a clear understanding, the role of a, a realtor, I believe, is a listener. And it's somebody who's going to sit and, and listen to what you want in a home, your lifestyle understand why you want that type of home um, and and put all that together with available properties uh, and show them that it's not taking out buyers first time or multiple time buyers and showing them properties that you think will meet their criteria sure we have a lot of tools that are available to us that that buyers don't um, maybe don't have um, and we do have the, the knowledge and we know the areas and we know the you know the the inventory but it's no different taking a buyer out in a car who isn't the least bit interested in looking at two-story homes here in the desert than it is taking a buyer out in a car who can't qualify for a $200,000 loan mm -hmm. and yet we're showing them $200,000 homes so it's it's my role I believe is still the role of a teacher you know, I mentioned earlier, I stood in front of a classroom for 27 years and had a blast. Um, and I've been able to turn that skill set into what I'm doing now. Um, I love to listen to what people want. You know, it might sound corny, but what are your hopes in finding a, in finding a home? What are your dreams? Um, you know, how long do you think you'll be in this home? Is this going to be a forever home or is this going to be your mid-step home? Um, so it's not that much different than, than doing the prequel. Yeah, 
I, I, I love, you know, thinking thinking with the end in mind, understanding what the prior... I, just enough said there. I mean, you know, coming at it from uh, a teaching perspective and an educational perspective is exactly how any professional should go about dealing with, uh, you know, their clients and prospects. That's yeah. that's cre that's credibility. If you do it the right way, you don't you don't need to sell anyone on anything. Just show no. your knowledge in a constructive exactly. way, and before you know it, you're doing business. So, I love it. You know, it's a great parallel to how professionals should act and how people right. should work with professionals. That's right. And but it's also the the consumer also has to educate themselves on what kind of a realtor he or she wants. Yeah. You know, um, what are they looking for in a realtor? And I know that's one of the, you know, discussion points today. Um, you know, do you want a good listener? Do you want somebody who's organized? Do you want, you know, uh, an expert in a specific area? Uh, right. Do you want a realtor with a string of designations but um, uh, isn't a good communicator? Um, yeah. So before a buyer gets in a car with a realtor, that buyer needs to understand what he or she wants in a realtor, what characteristics professionally, and you're going to spend a lot of time with that person. So personality-wise, are you going to get along with that realtor? Exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm going to say it, but don't be afraid to fire your realtor if, if your realtor is not performing up to your expectations. Um, get referrals. I, I always tell uh, uh, um, buyers, if I wasn't referred to you, then you should be asking me for references from from yeah. past buyers, from past clients, even clients that haven't purchased. You know, get references from me. Um, referral. You know, we work on the referral system, and referrals are very important to us. Uh, and you know, um, and I, I'll go back to the middle, the millennial age group. They are typically um, very, very educated when they come to us um, technology-wise. Um, some of them really don't know a lot about the process of buying a home, and it's my job to educate them, but they've got some responsibilities before they even come to us. They need to, you know, interview realtors. Uh, they need to be comfortable with lenders that either we suggest I'll usually suggest two or three local lenders. I like working with local lenders because they're easier to um, access. I know I can pick up the phone on a Saturday night and ask for a prequal and I'll have it. Um, to some folks that's a little strange because they've been online and they're looking at different lenders that are online lenders and that's that's a little bit of a difficulty for me because I need to be able to communicate with my lender as quickly as I need them. Couldn't have said it any better, Martha. Hey, hey, Douglas, I wanted to ask you, um, because so much research can be done now on the web, you know, you can search on sites like Redfin or Trulia to kind of do yep. research even before meeting with a real estate agent. What, what advice do you have for somebody who is kind of, you know, doing some research, trying to figure out where they want to live, location-wise, sure. uh, even buying an agent? Uh, it's, uh, factors you consider while choosing a location of your home or specific to the agent, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, just like factors when looking for a home, because a lot of it can be done, you can look on, you know... Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, um, I know one of the questions later on are like, what are the tools you use, but as far as <laughs> factors, um, you know, and, and, you know, let's go through, let's go through the main ones, you know, yeah. you're always going to hear schools, right? So schools are always a big one, also access to healthcare facilities, proximity to mass transit, or the highway, if you're a commuter, that's going to be a big one. Uh, speaking of transit, you might want to actually see how close that home is to the, you know, if it's too yeah. close to the highway <laughs> or the train station, my wife will always be like, Doug, you know that home's right up against the train tracks, that's why it's a deal. I'm like, I did not see that. So, um, you know, if noise and safety are a concern, yes, you don't want children running in the backyard or, you know, across a highway playing ball, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, Often overlooked is outdoor space, parks and recreation. You know, if you value uh, going on a nature hike and, and enjoying what the town's part, you know, and, and outdoor space, then that's going to be something. Um, you know, I also had that point about you know these are better reasons to think of your home than you know the whole thing we just talked about with it being an investment. You know, uh, so you're going to live there, you're going to enjoy it. These are the things that will help you. Uh, either enjoy it more or less, depending on what you get out of it. 
I would also say you're not going to get everything. You know, Martha, you would tell me, you know, hey, put together a list of your must-haves, and you know, we're not talking about with the home itself right now, but more more with the area. You know, uh, what are your must what are your must-haves? What can you do with and without? And maybe you start putting a list together like that and, and start to factor those things in when you think about uh, location. But you know, pe people typically start with health and education. And education. Yeah, you know, those those are the big big ones, and I'm sure I missed a laundry list of stuff. But uh, nonetheless, you know, I think I think if you got through at least half of those, you're you're pretty much coming up with some good understanding about what you want for yourself. And you have to also look at trade-offs. If you find the perfect home, or you know, the perfect in air quotes yeah. home, um, are you willing to trade off location? And that's that's a question a lot of buyers have to ask themselves. You know, I'm not really crazy about the location. Um, I wanted faster access to the interstate to get downtown, but this is exactly the house my wife wants. Mm. That's important. <laughs> or this is exactly the house that, you know, fits my lifestyle. Um, so buyers have to be aware of trade offs. Yep. My first time home buyer that I talked about a little while ago, when it was all said and done, I took him out for a glass of champagne and I said, well, so what do you think? Now you're a homeowner. And he looked at me and he said, this is not HGTV. And I, and I thought that was perfect because it isn't. You know, they watch, yeah. you, you spend hours in front of the, the show and I, and I am guilty of doing that. Um, but it's not HGTV. There are a lot of bumps along the way for many, many home buyers. You're, Martha, you're saying you can't flip a home in 30 minutes on <laughs> right. Everyone gets the property, brothers. Come on. I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. you're going to get a beautiful home in six weeks. You know, a couple snags. It but always nothing works out. <laughs> no, those, those are all really good points and, you know, kind of give you a real-life example of that. As my wife and I look at homes, you know, a big thing for me is proximity to that train station. You know, our, our offices are in one pen, and that's, that's pretty much Penn Station. Yeah. So, um, you know, and what about where she works? Is she going to be commuting into the city uh, as well? And, you know, ha so, you know, transportation itself, especially around big urban centers, it probably becomes one of those very hot topics or way up there on the top of the list with schools. You know, it's almost like there's enough hospitals around here between Manhattan and the Burbs, not necessarily worried about getting, you know, good care. I mean, people travel all over the world to get to New York to get that kind of care. I think I'm more concerned with, uh, you know, do I need to take a car to the train station? Will there be a spot at the train station? Get into the city? Then do I got to get on the subway and do that all backwards? And what if my kid needs me and I got to get there quickly? You know, these are the real life, you know, De, you know, down and dirty details of making these types of decisions. I mean, we, quality of life. Yeah, we just talked about one thing, just yeah, transit. Yeah, yeah. You know, who would have thought transit just took you know a couple minutes here and more like you know a whole days of thinking in in home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Martha, you know, we've just talked about a, a number of these factors that are people go through when they're trying to decide on where to live and 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 the home itself. And and some of this is just like numbers driven. Some of it is just um, you know, the structure of the house, but what about the emotional side and how do people balance the emotional side when making a purchase on a home? Well, if you know the answer to that question, I'd love to have it because <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I think for a lot of for a lot of buyers, if they put their financial um, if they put their financial uh, home in order first, if you will, that can take some of the emotional out of it because they're not going to walk into a home that's above their price point and get excited about it because they know what their price point is. So again, we go back to that education. But um, again, the heart of a teacher, I find it sometimes hard not to get emotionally involved with the clients and knowing what they want. Um, you know, you can work with a client for a year trying to find them the home that they will walk into and you know the minute they see it that this is going to be the home um, and you hope that the inspections go well and, you know, the loan qualification, uh, the underwriting continues at a good pace and that we close on time. But you want to get excited for uh, your buyers and you, you do have an opportunity and I think an obligation to point out things in a home that you know will strike a chord with them that perhaps they don't see right away. 
Um, uh, you know, for instance, if you've got teenagers in the home, you might want a split bedroom plan where the teenagers are on the other side of the home. Um, for a first-time home buyer, that might not be important. They might rather have, you know, the big space for entertaining. Um, right. So. It, it is the, the emotional part of it is a very big part of it. That's the golden ticket, you know. If, I, I think any uh, client facing customer service, you know, in businesses, you know, my father would always say, um, you know, in our business, he did the, does the same thing I do. You know, managing your money is the easy part, you know, putting myself in your shoes. Yeah. That's the hard part, you yeah. know, and it really is. Numbers are fixed, numbers don't. Feel. Numbers don't have emotions. If you put emotions with numbers, you, you know, crazy things start to happen. You know, that's right. That's mistakes right. Mistakes or you know, just errors, and you know, that's why we really try and separate those two. And Mark, that was a good point. You know, if that's the talent of any professional, can can you help your client uh, uh, separate those two things and provide them with clarity? so that they can make a constructive decision, you know, and, and that's our role. So, Martha, I guess we're psychologists now. Um, <laughs> I have no formal training in this. I have to put that out there. But a lot of the days I feel like, okay, I'm a financial advisor, a, a planner, an asset manager, but 50% or more is definitely please have a seat on my couch and tell me about your problems. Right. It, it's reading It's reading your clients, and again, I'll, for the first time home buyer, it's reading their facial expressions. It's reading the way that they dash from, from one room to another. It, it is an emotional experience, and as much as we'd like to take the emotion out of it, and probably, uh, you know, a lot of people would say that it would be a smart thing to do, it's very difficult because you want to be excited for them. You want to see them reach that goal. You take the emotions out of it, and you lose humanity. That's, so. there you <laughs> that's, go. Right, that's right. That's right. There you go. Uh, well, I can't believe this hour has been flying by, guys. We haven't got a chance to go through all the questions, but this has been so informative. This has been so wonderful. I want to ask you guys just for some last-minute suggestions for first-time home buyers. People are interested in buying a home. Just some last-minute tips you guys might have, and Douglas, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, not a problem. So, you know, big decision here, a big financial decision, and it all comes down to planning and literacy and understanding the decision that you have on your hand and hands and how to approach it. Martha and I would, and I'll speak for you here a little bit, Martha, we'd both agree sitting down with professionals who can offer you uh, due diligence, uh, a, a proper a standard, if not greater level of care when approaching these things is an amazing way to go about this. Uh, you, you, you have to do your due diligence. You have to plan for this. It's too big of an issue uh, to get wrong. You don't want to make financial missteps here, especially if you're coming off one. So we talked a lot about millennials and, you know, first-time home buyers are probably younger people right now. You know, if you're feeling a little worn out from your experience previously of amassing student loan debt, or making other mistakes, if you know, then this is going to be that much more emotional and that much more difficult for you to do. So get your ducks in a row. Get those resources uh, uh, that you need. Surround yourself with the people and knowledge so that it's not a bigger deal than it needs to be, but rather something that becomes a uh, ultimately an informed decision on your part. You know, it has to make sense. You have to afford it, and you have to feel good about doing it. If you can say yes to all three of those things on any financial decision, let alone home buying, you shouldn't necessarily do it, but you <laughs> have the criteria met to go ahead and make that constructive decision. You still might say no. And if you did say no to one of those three things, you know, the first two are easy, you know, can you afford it? If the answer is no, don't do it. Does it, you know, does it make sense if the answer is no? Don't do it. And the hardest one is do you feel good about doing that? That's the subjective emotional one. If you say no, don't do it because you're going to have something we call buyer's remorse and that's never fun and it's going to haunt you. So in summary, just get your ducks in a row, educate yourself, work with financial professionals and have a plan. You can visit CFP 
uh, or you can do let's make a plan dot org. You can visit my website uh, www.douglasbonaparte.com. Uh, you can check out our firm's website www.lwp.nyc and see that there are these tools out there. There are ways to uh, get informed. Thank you, Douglas. Martha, just some last-minute tips. Yeah, just real quickly, um, I echo just shortly what um, uh, or briefly what um, Douglas said. Educate yourself. In today's society, there's no reason why a consumer can't educate themselves both from the uh, on the financial uh, status of of um, of where they are and also the the real estate aspect. There's so many resources out there that excuse the pun, but are just a click away. Um, educate yourself and find somebody to work with who has the heart of a teacher, has the heart of an educator, and is also educated and can answer your questions and isn't afraid to go look for the answers. And don't, first time home buyers, don't be afraid to ask the questions. They are not insignificant. It is a big deal. It's okay to get nervous when somebody's when the lender's going to pull your credit report, but ha you've got to do it. You've got to make that step. So educate yourself, go forward with your dreams, and um, get a good realtor and a good lender to help you. Thank you, Martha and Rod. Yeah, it's magic. I went from Texas to California in like 30 <laughs> seconds. <I love> <laughs> I'm visiting Costa Mesa and my computer crashed, so here I ran down the hall. Um, no, it, my tip of the week is almost the same one I always have, I think. Get your credit report, but do it at least three months prior to applying for a mortgage. Better six months. Better still, get it once a year. Know what's there. Take care of it all the time. Make sure that it's where it needs to be because and that's going to be the first step when you apply for a mortgage. That lender is going to get your credit reports. They're going to want to look at your scores. If you know what they are going in, it makes that process so much easier, so much faster gets rid of the surprises. So you know what's in that credit report. It's, it's again, it goes back to getting educated just like Douglas said and Martha said. You know, Gain knowledge, get the report, know what's there. Take care of it and, and your the next steps get easier. I just want to add one more thing in terms of the buying process. Know ahead of time. Have your realtor sit down with you and, and explain the buying process. It's not just going to stop with the lender. It, you've got paperwork that has to be signed. You have timelines that have to be uh, maintained and honored. And your realtor is responsible for that. Respond to your lender when your lender asks for documents. Go ahead and surrender them. You, you have to. You, you're you're going to be asked for them, so go ahead and take them. Um, uh, but Know what the process is before you before you jump into it. Great point. Before we go, uh, Douglas, can you share where people can learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. I know I rattled off some websites there, but um, absolutely. So you know, I, I bill myself as New York's financial advisor for millennials. It's that's where my heart is. I obviously serve. Uh, a, a wealth of individuals and families and small businesses, but you can uh, you can check me out on on my me media website. You can go to Doug, uh, www.douglasbonaparte.com. You can check out uh, my firm's webpage at www.lwp.nyc. That's life and wealth planning, and you should also check out the CFP board's website. Let's make a plan.org or cfp.net. I got that wrong on the last one. These are all great places to get the information you need from a financial planning point of view. Uh, and and whether you're a, a millennial uh, or or a baby boomer, you know all of these things still apply to you. It's it's you know financial literacy. And, and uh, financial education knows no age, color, creed, religion. This is stuff you're going to use every day. And you know, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's not as uh, you know, a food blog probably does better than a personal finance blog. People love food. You know, I wish personal finance was something. We'll we'll get it there. Hopefully, these initiatives like we're doing here today uh, is is going to do that. So a big thank you to Experian, Martha. Everyone who joined us in the uh, tweet session, you know, this is amazing. These are the, exactly the types of things that will uh, make us a much more financially uh, literate society. It's a must. Let's make it happen. Thanks again. Thanks, Douglas. And Martha, where can people learn more about you? 
I work for Long Realty Company in uh, Southern Arizona in Tucson. Uh, the company website is longrealty.com. Um, my website is uh, www.marthastaten.com, and that will uh, take you also to my company um, webpage. Um, I don't. I don't have as many web pages as Douglas, <laughs> but I do want to, uh, you know, give a shout out to Long Realty. Um, they are the largest uh, real estate company in Southern Arizona. Well, Douglas and Martha, thank you so much for being awesome guests. It's just been a thrill it's talking been to you. Fun. Learning. Thank from you. you. Yes, this is amazing. Thank you so thank much. You. Uh, I want to let everyone see. Uh, we had asked our. Um, a bunch of personal finance bloggers. We told them about this chat with you guys and asked for some advice from them. And the Debt Roundup uh, said uh, their tip was to don't get lured into what the bank tells you you can afford. Make sure you understand your budget needs and what you can truly afford. That's a good one. Yeah, and uh, Jim Wang said to start budgeting like you have the mortgage, which will probably be higher than whatever you're paying now for housing. Use the savings toward a down payment. And by budging this way, you'll really start to feel whether or not you can afford the house you think you can afford. Okay. And uh, Kate Hurl said, uh, be sure to set aside 20 to 30 percent of your monthly payment for maintenance. Most new homeowners have no idea how much it costs to maintain a home. Heck, I bought a home only for 20 years, and I still get surprised. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. We didn't get to that today, but there are so many different um, costs and expenses associated with home ownership that. You know, you don't realize until you get into the home. So yeah, that's we gotta clean the pool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, Miranda Marquette, she said, it's all about lifestyle. Before you decide to buy, uh, figure out what sorts of lifestyle you plan on having, and don't view your primary residence as a financial investment. It's an emotional investment. There you yeah, go. Echoing exactly what you guys said. Yep. And uh, Jim Wang uh, followed up by saying, when you're looking for a home, remember human psychology. This is, goes back to what, <laughs> what Douglas was saying. We often decide based on emotions, then try to back it up with logic. Don't fight it. Look until you find the house you love, then buy reasons why you shouldn't buy it. Hmm. Don't look at a house based on stats and try to convince yourself that you love it when you don't initially. Good point. Yeah, so I love that. So uh, I want to let everybody know, you know, Douglas and Martha uh, shared a bunch of different websites and resources. We're going to get links uh, for all of that up on our Experian blog, and the short URL is ex.pn slash first home, so we'll make sure you have the links uh, so you can learn more about Douglas as well as Martha, and then a lot of the different resources that Douglas uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. So just go to Experian, uh, ex.pn slash first home. And I want to let you know that we have this chat every Wednesday on Twitter and on YouTube at 3 p.m. Eastern. If you'd like to see past chats, you can go to the Experian website, and the website is experian.com slash credit chat. Uh, we have the videos there, the podcasts, the slide shares, everything right there. And uh, I want to let you know that next week we're talking about financial independence as we approach Independence Day, so make sure to join us next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And as always, we love to hear from our community. So if you have su suggestions on topics, if you have suggestions on who you'd like featured in this panel, please tweet us. Our Twitter handle is at Experian underscore US. And last, we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any other credit chats coming up. Uh, we want to thank everyone for tweeting and talking with us, especially Martha and Douglas for joining us today. And we look forward to talking with you all next Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. bye. Thanks, Douglas.